said, I want to be an explorer. I want to go where other people hadn't been. And in my mindset at that time, the camel was slightly secondary until I discovered that this amazing wild camel had survived 43 atmospheric nuclear tests. And also, the most amazing thing is that they drink salt water with a higher content of salt than seawater. I do my journeys now and, the, and after the first one, all the others, on camels, because it's much easier to find a wild camel if you're on a camel. Two remarkable things, the salt water and the nuclear test. These camels had survived, and then I became completely addicted to saving the wild camel. Whether you're a camel owner, wannabe camel owner, or simply an adoring camel fan, you're in the right place for some fun, useful, and interesting camel talk. This is the Camel Connection Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Tara. And I'm Russell. Join us here for fun learning about camels, how to care for, train, and handle them, plus insider stories and interviews. And also some interesting stories of our lifestyle with camels, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the very funny. Make sure you've subscribed now so you don't miss out on an episode. Now, some of these podcasts are an audio take of our video, so be sure to check those out on our blog for lots of how-to visuals and, of course, lots of camels. This is your one and only go-to podcast, all about camels. John Hare is no stranger to adventure and camels as an explorer, conservationist, author and co-founder of the Wild Camel Protection Foundation. John has undertook a number of incredible expeditions with camels into remote parts of the world, frequently travelling alone. This alone has kindled John Hare's lifelong passion for camels. Some of John Hare's amazing camel expeditions include being part of a scientific team to research the status of the wild camel in Mongolia, the eighth most endangered large mammal in the world. The Wild Camel Protection Foundation has been responsible for establishing the Hunter Hall Captive Wild Camel Breeding Centre in Mongolia with 12 wild camels, which had been captured by Mongolian herdsmen. This is the only place where the wild camel is held in captivity apart from two zoos in China. In 2010, the population had increased from 12 to 25. Now there is a plan to undertake the first release of the captive wild camel back into the Gobi Desert. John has completed some incredible camel expeditions in places like Kenya, the Gobi Desert, Mongolia and China, crossing the Sahara Desert, experiencing both the Bactrian and Dromedary camel in his travels. So I think it's fair to say that John Hare is a massive camel lover and in his case, a protector too. First, we just want to thank you so much and welcome you to Absolutely. our podcast. And um, Russell's going to start with a few rapid fire questions. So they're just a little bit of fun so people can get to know you. And you just all you have to do is just state your preference. Are you okay. ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Where you, where you go? Okay, so here's 13 rapid-fire questions. If you had to choose, which would you choose? In other words, state your preference. Desert or ocean? Desert. Sweet or savoury? Savoury. Okay. <laughs> Day or night? Uh, daytime. Okay. Now, technology or old school? Anything but technology. <laughs> Good on you. Uh, traveller or homebody? Now, come on, that, that, that isn't a question you should be asking. <laughs> I think we can safely say traveller. Paper or computer? Paper. Good. Okay, movie or a good series? I don't have a television. <laughs> Great. Okay, that answers that too. I love <laughs> okay. it. Okay, a simple one. Dog or cat? Cat. Oh, dog, 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 dog. Dog. Dog every time, yeah. Okay, <laughs> right, okay. Tea or coffee? Tea. 
Yes. I like both, but tea and if I was told I could have one tea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, okay. Truth or dare? A oh, dare. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Book or screen? A uh, book. Book. All right. Second last one. Spontaneous or planned? Uh, that's a difficult one. Um, I've got to answer this. Um, I do plan my expeditions. Um, however, in order to make the decision to go on an expedition, I usually make an impulsive or a spontaneous decision. Yes. When that decision has been made, I plan. I don't just go in recklessly. Yes. If you understand my We answer. sure do. <laughs> uh, fully get that. Um, okay, relaxing holiday or adventure? <laughs> Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> I really can't see you sitting by the pool. It should be self-evident. I've never yeah. seen somebody who goes and sits by the seaside. No, no. no. <laughs> Adventure, of course. Okay, and the last, very last uh, question here. What did you want to be when you were growing up? An explorer. I, that's wow. absolutely true. And I told my father when I was about 12, and he said, now, come on. Come on, lad, think of something sensible. I said, no, Dad, I want to go to, and I can remember my words, the places where other people have not been. Oh, Good on you. And you've done yeah. that. That's amazing. And I've done that in a way, yeah, I have, actually, yeah. Yeah, no, that's terrific. So, so John, where did you grow up as a child? I grew up not, I grew up not far from where I'm talking to you now. Right. I'm talking to you from a village uh, called Benenden in Kent, a small uh, agricultural type village. I grew up about um, 20 miles away, um, quite near the sea, um, in another little town called Bexhill. Right. Amazing. Okay. I, 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 yeah, your travels just from where you've come from, and I've, I love that when you were a child you wanted to be an explorer, and that's exactly what you made happen, and I love that so much. And we'd love to hear if you can tell us about the first time that when you met a camel and your first impressions. Well, that's rather an interesting one. Um, I was something which is so old-fashioned that most of your listeners won't even understand what I'm talking about, but I was the last administrator in, um, in northern Nigeria, the British administrator, mm. uh, who was sent out there just before independence. The country got independence. Yeah, and what year are we... Independent, what year are we looking sorry? at there, John? We're looking at 58. Right. Incredible. So you, can, you, can start, you can start doing your math. Yes. <laughs> 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 um, and and, and uh, uh, in 1960, they had a huge, what was called a Durbar, a parade. And I was responsible for one of the, uh, you'd call it a state, let's call it a province. Yes. Uh, to send a contingent from the province up to this Durbar. Now, a Durbar was a great mass of colorful tribal peoples coming to celebrate independence. Now, I had to take... Um, 2,000 people, 500 horses, and 20 camels. Right. We had to trek them for, trek them for, trek them for two weeks before we got to the Derba. And so that was the first time I came across camels. That's incredible. Right. And what was your first impression of them, John? Well, the first impression, I suppose, as I saw them first of all, and I had no experience of them, and of course they were, they were, you know, they weren't treated as well as they can be treated. Mm. Um, I found them uh, an animal. I've always grown up with horses. I've, mm. uh, I've ridden horses all my life. I still ride horses. And um, camels, I thought they were a bit fun. They're very different from a horse. Um, I've, of course, I've learned a lot about them, and I, I could talk a lot about camels. <laughs> but you're asking for first impressions. First impressions, I thought they were a bit cussed. A bit difficult. Yes. Yeah, I think a lot of people have that impression about camels. Um, in fact, it was only today I, I, I was at a nursing home and, and a lovely old man came up to me. He saw my wind cheater and had a big picture of a camel on it and he said, oh, camels, they do nothing but bite. They're very dangerous. Look out for them. And he had, had he been around camels? I didn't ask. <laughs> 
But I, I wouldn't give that impression if you ask me, what do you think of camels now? Exactly. I, yeah. You know, I, could, I, I, I certainly would not. You asked me for first impression. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And the media doesn't really portray the camel in a positive light in that sense. No, I, I can tell you a story later about just how amazing a camel is. We would love, we would to, love hear to hear that. it. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Mm. I would like to ask first, if you don't mind, is like I, I believe I think your age is really impressive and how mm. you just keep doing stuff. Do you mind sharing with people how old you are? Um, well, I'm not like a girl who, who um, tries to say she's five years younger than she is. <laughs> um, eight, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm uh, um, 84. Very That's good. That's amazing. That's really good. And I just just the stuff that you're tre- achieving to this day. I think that's inspiring to a lot of people. So I, yeah. I th- well, I would say to your audience, um, if they're getting on a bit, <coughs> never think or use the word retirement. Yes. Once you start thinking you're retiring, then you, you're finished. Yeah. Don't use it. Don't even think of it. I've never, I never, in fact, I never hardly ever use that word because um, I haven't. And I just keep on going and I'll, God willing, I'll keep on going till I drop. Yeah. I that, love that. I love attitude. that advice. Yeah. That's perfect. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So, gee whiz, I mean, you know, there's so much that we could talk about here. We've really got to whittle it down to... (laughs) You've done so much with camels. I just can't believe this, you know. When I look at, you know, some of the things that you've done, okay, so you've gone uh, uh, an expedition to two unmapped valleys deep in the Gobi sand dunes. Yeah, I was working... um, My life has been divided into three segments. First of all, I was in Africa, as I told you, in northern Nigeria. Yes. I got sent to one of the remotest parts of northern Nigeria in those days. It was a plateau, a big plateau, with two major tribes living on the top of it. And I was, you know, one was the big white chief. And um, there were no roads on that plateau because it was, escarpment was very steep. And it was 5,200 feet, which I climbed, I think, 13 times. When I got to the top, it was a 75-mile ride to my house on a horseback. And so, you see, for four years in my 20s, I lived in really, really remote surroundings. And believe me, in one period, I didn't see a white person for six months. That's right. a long time. Yeah. And you're, uh, you know, a real bushy. I, you can appreciate this in Australia. Yeah. And um, so that conditioned me for, for living in the wild, living in, in tough places. Yes. So later my life developed. Phase two was when I um, had a bit of common sense and settled down and got married. I, you know, I had a long, married a long-suffering wife and had three children. And then I wrote and I advised the publisher. I'd always written all my life, written books and, and this and that. Yes. And I've written 32 books for children. 32 and, books. And, um, wow. Yeah. No, I wrote, I wrote under a pseudonym, which I'm not going to tell you what it is. But um, just take it from me that I wrote um, 32 books. Incredible. Okay. And <laughs> um, so then that phase, and so I then was, I w- believe it or not, I went to um, Nairobi in, in, in Kenya um, to work for the United Nations Environment Program. But the United Nations didn't suit my temperament at all. It's incredibly mm-hmm. bureaucratic, yeah. and for one reason or another, but it did give me a chance to start a photographic competition on the environment. Now, this was when Soviet Union was collapsing, Mm -hmm. and um, I suggested to the UN they had a photographic competition highlighting the environmental damage, the other side of the Iron Curtain, which had never been seen by anybody. Mm -hmm. They agreed, and Cannon backed backed it, and it was a great success. We had 32,000 photographs, and I was allowed to take the winning photographs around the world. And I got to Moscow just when the Soviet Union was collapsing. Whoa. And I was invited to show the photographs. And I saw a very interesting looking Russian. He looked a bit like Stalin with a great droopy moustache. Yes. And I went up to him and I said, what do you do? And he said, I lead the joint Russian 
Mongolian expeditions into the Gobi Desert. Mm. I looked him in the face and I said, I'd do anything to come with you. Yes. And he said, get me some, get me some foreign exchange if you, and, and you can. Because yes. they were broke. Russia was broke at the time. And uh, I said, how much do you want? He said, $2,000. That's US dollars, not Australian dollars. And uh, I said, done. I'll get it for you. I got it for him. And then he said, what's your... Are you a scientist? I said, no. He said, what, go through your CV. So I went through the CV. And uh, he, he looked stony-faced. He said, Professor Sokolov isn't going to like this. And I said, well, stop, <laughs> Professor Sokolov. You've got the money, and you said you'd take me. And then I suddenly said what I told you. I had experience with a camel uh, in Nigeria oh, a long time ago. A camel, he said, that's it. Come as the wild camel expert. So that's why, why, how I started. I went, no, nothing. <laughs> and then, um, and I'm going to an expedition. And I often talk to kiddies, uh, schools. I talk to a lot of schools. And I always tell the children, look, you, uh, you most likely don't know what you're going to do in life. I didn't know what I was really going to do in life. But mm-hmm. something will come across your shade of vision or some little remark. Go for it if you think it's right. Yes. Because it might not come again. And I said, look at me, an old fogey. Look how it changed my life. At that time, I was in my 50s. And um, it changed my life completely. So I went on the expedition. Next year, I was, I was um, invited to speak at a conference about the wild camel. Can you believe it? <laughs> Only one year's expedition. Yes. Uh, one, one expedition. And I saw in the audience there were a lot of Chinese scientists. And I knew that the wild camel lived in the former nuclear test area of China. Yep. How the hell to get in there? So I said, I appealed to the Chinese to allow me to go into the, into the Lopnor area. Really tongue-in-cheek, I didn't think they'd agree. <laughs> and um, golly, uh, that night in my hotel there was a knock on the door, and a man called Professor Yuan Goying, a great friend of mine, he knocked on the door and he said, John Hare, I can get you in. My brother is a general in the Chinese army. Oh my and he gosh. has jurisdiction over, over Loch Nor, but you mustn't tell Beijing. <laughs> and so that's how I got in, and that's how I did the first expedition exploring for the wild camel in China in the forbidden area of Loch Nor. And what year was this? Uh, that was 19, well, 93 I went with the Russians into Mongolia, 95 I went with the Chinese, 96, 97, 99 I went with the with the Chinese 2006, I went with the Chinese 2013, I went with the Chinese. And in the interim, because I was working for the UN, I knew the sort of channels of how you could have tried to get money. I managed to get some money from the World Bank. We got $650,000. Wow. And I put a proposal forward to the Chinese to set up a nature reserve in their former nuclear test area. And because I got money, of course, they listened to me. Mm. And um, we set up the Loch Nor Wild Camel Nature Reserve, which is there and running to this day. That is an incredible Hats off to you, sir. Hats achievement. Off to you. That's incredible. But there's something quite remarkable that a lot of people probably wouldn't know about this uh, this uh, nuclear site, I suppose you can say. Um, would you like to explain to people what's so remarkable about how the camels have actually lived through this uh, nuclear exactly. site? Exactly. Now, what, <clears throat> what I told you in answer to your earlier question was that I wanted to be an explorer. I wanted to go where other people hadn't been. Yes. <clears throat> there was a chance to do just that. Yes. And in my mindset at that time, the camel was slightly secondary until I discovered that this amazing wild camel had survived 43 atmospheric nuclear tests of which over half were more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. And also, the most amazing thing is that they drink salt water with a higher content of salt than seawater. And our domestic camels, because I do my journeys now and and after the first one, all the others, on camels, because it's much easier to find a wild camel if you're on a camel yes. than in a, in a jeep, because they pick up the noise of the jeep and they run off. The yes. well, these yes. two remarkable things, the salt water and the nuclear test, these camels had survived. And then I became 
completely addicted to saving the wild camel. Yeah. That's um, incredible. Because of those facts. Yeah. So did anybody know at that time that there were wild camels in that nuclear test, the old nuclear test zone? Um, well, the Chinese knew. Uh, for, for example, my professor, or the professor, not my professor, the professor who contacted me, he knew. That's, that's why... He, he wanted to get me in there. Okay. Um, the local people knew, yes, the local people knew, but um, the outside world, not very many, knew anything about the wild camel at all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and tell me, did, the, uh, or did you observe or see any th- evidence whatsoever that the nuclear testing actually had an effect on the camels at all? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. That's incredible. Um, and we, we, we found a lot of um, interesting uh, material that had gone up in the air and come down again. Um, and, of course, I, I wasn't totally foolhardy. I went to um, an expert at Oxford University in England who was the first lady scientist to go into Chernobyl. Yes. British lady scientist. And I said, look, am I being crazy? I can get into the Lochnor nuclear test site. Um, you know, radiation and everything. And she said, no, um, as long as you don't drink the water or eat the vegetation. Well, of course, I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the camels do. And um, I saw no ill effects at all. I would like to make a point here, just in case I forget to say it. You have a lot of camels in Australia, and I've been to Australia, and I've seen the Kalamunda camel people and other people in Australia. Mm -hmm. Your camels are feral. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know some of your organizations call them the wild camel, whatever, but they're not. They're feral. They're domestic camels that have definitely gone wild. Yes. And a lot of people said your wild camel is also feral, that the double-humped Bactrian camel used on the Silk Road for centuries, some of them had run away and become feral. But... In the Mongolian language, they call the wild camel Hustagai, and Hustagai means flathead. In other words, in their language, they had a word for the wild camel because the shape of its skull is different to Mm -hmm. the domestic camel. So we tested this theory, and when I went on all these expeditions, I sent bone and blood and hair to the veterinary university in Vienna, and... After five years of genetic testing, uh, paid for incidentally by our foundation, they said this is a totally new and separate species which separated from any other form of camel 750,000 years ago. And the paper is published and anybody can get hold of that paper. So it is a separate species of camel. That and, is incredible. as I say, unlike your feral camels in Australia. Yes, yeah. and that's a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up because a lot of people don't, and, and us included, is we didn't realize there was a difference between the Mongolian domestic Bactrian camel and the wild camel, and and it's and now you mention the flat head that you can actually see that distinctive difference mm. between the two, and I, I find that incredibly impressive that your found well, your foundation you has put um, donations to good work and obviously your hard work too, and everybody else that's involved to do these really important studies. I honestly think that we need more camel studies, and um, that that sounds like one of the quite biggest one that I've really heard of. Yeah. I'm also um, guilty, for want of a better word, of using the word wild um, to describe uh, camels here in Australia, out in the outback, and whereas, uh, you know, they are feral, they didn't um, originate, they're not Aboriginal to the, to the Australian landscape. And I think that's really clarified, especially for myself, and, you know, I've been involved yeah. now for well, uh, I'm, I'm, years. I'm, I'm very pleased, pleased to do that. Of course, you know, some of your le- listeners might, w- will not un- have understood this, but a feral animal, you <laughs> like you've got in Australia plenty of feral dogs and cats, mm. which are causing huge problems. And the same as a feral camel. In other words, it's a, a domesticated creature which has gone wild. In yes. the case of the camels, they were put into the wild when, you know, I, I've got wonderful photographs from a guy in Alice Springs 
um, showing the camels taking the telegraph poles across Australia, which yes. is what the main reason they were brought in originally. Yeah. Mm. And um, of course, once once they were no longer useful, they were just put out in the bush, but they lovely conditions for them, and they just bred and yes. multiplied. I think you've got about half a million now. Incredible. Well, it depends who you got. talk to. Yes, that's right. Some people say a million. Yeah, they're, not, they're, not, they're not wild animals. They're mm. feral. Mm. But a wild camel is totally... If you go to to uh, corroborate this the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature based in Geneva, they now des designated the Bactrian camel, double humped and the wild camel, Camelus ferris and Camelus bactrianus ferris, it's now a separate species. Right. So if somebody had um, if somebody was unsure whether they had um, a wild camel species or a domesticated bactrian, would a bl blood test easily prove that? Yeah. Uh, they have a 3.5 genetic difference from the uh, bactrian camel and uh, that's as great as we have from a chimpanzee. Yeah. Okay. Wow, okay. Right. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> keep, keep going, John. You're blowing us out of the water it, here. <laughs> we're getting a lot of value from this like everybody else. That is just incredible. So you've obviously dealt with the domesticated Bactrian camel in Mongolia and the wild camel. Is there big differences besides obviously their head, which we've talked about, that you have noticed between the two? Like uh, is one more slender or one's easy to put more weight on or anything like that? Uh, um, you can't domesticate a wild camel so you wouldn't put weight on it. Yeah. Uh, in other words, they've never been ridden. They've no, I mean like uh, genetically wise, like the feeding, like are they yeah, easy? Uh, no, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, the, the biggest difference and the one you pick up very quickly if you came with me to Mongolia is the size of the hump. And the two humps on a wild camel are spaced further apart. Right. That's just that's the... Uh, you know, whereas you will find a domestic double hump camel, a Bactrian camel, the humps are very much closer together. Yeah. And they're very, they're always taut and in a little tiny pyramid. Now, um, whereas a Bactrian camel, the humps flop over from side to side uh, when they're empty of fat. Um, and people said to me, oh, in your breeding center in Mongolia, when they're eating good hay and good food, their humps will grow and they'll flop over. They've never done that. I've never oh. seen a wild camel with floppy humps or wow. with anything other than upright pointed humps. So that is the difference that anybody can pick up. They're also a rather uniformly um, yellowy brown color, mm -hmm. whereas with the Bactrian camel, you can range from black to to albino practically yes. white yeah. um, so you've got a huge range with the Bactrian camel but uniformly the wild camel is a single colour right okay. that's incredible now, do you do you know of any inst incidences of anyone training the wild camels at all um, well the Mongolians uh, sometimes catch them mm. or catch a bull and now this is for a different reason they then they can intermate interbreed with the Bactrian camel, and a lot of Mongolians are keen on camel racing. Mm. And if you cross cross a wild camel with a domestic camel, and your your hybrid is born, he can run much faster than the normal Bactrian camel. So we, <laughs> we're trying to stop that actually because we don't want hybrids. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, where there's a lot of edu we do a lot of educational work amongst the local communities, and one of the things we're doing is to try very hard to discourage this uh, capture and crossbreeding. But they never ride the wild camel, and nobody's ever been able to. I've never, seen, you know, never heard of it. Right. And they can't. Ca they've never domesticated them, so they can carry loads. Right. Okay. So. So they've a... never been domesticated in all of history that you know. Never. Of. Wow. Oh, no, no, they no. must be of a different mindset as well. Yeah, I mean, the analogy I use to people to make it easier to understand is that um, they're like the wolf to the dogs. I mean, all dogs originated from uh, the wolf over, yeah. over millennia, 
And uh, this camel is, I could talk to you for a long time about the evolution of camels, but uh, this camel, uh, we think anyway, is, um, could be uh, the ancestor of camels generally, because very quickly the camel originated, the camel is the little tiny animal, like the horse was a tiny animal. Mm -hmm. It originated in the Arizona desert in what is now America. Mm -hmm. And some went down to South America and became llamas, alpacas, uh, vicuna, and guanaco. And then others went over the Bering Strait into Asia. It was incredibly cold. And so they developed two humps for fat to keep them alive. They pushed on further, further. They got into what we call the Middle East today. It was hot. Mm. They didn't need two humps, so they um, they uh, evolved just one hump. And if you look at the weak old embryo of a dromedary or one hump camel, you'll see the remains of a second hump. So the double hump camel is an ancestor of the dromedary camels that you have feral in Australia, for example. And uh, so it, 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 it's an ancestor because you can see that second hump, it, it disappears before it's born. So our, our fellow, the wild camel, we think, um, goes further back in the evolutionary state and it could be, um, and certainly in the Central Asia, it could be the ancestor of the uh, the uh, old camels. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, uh, yeah, the, his, a lot of people actually don't understand that camels were really tiny once. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, and horses were too. Yes. Mm. Uh, horses, they were tiny little animals. That's right. If, you, if anybody um, who's listening goes to the Natural History Museum in New York, They've got a wonderful exhibit of the tiny little camelids that they, what they found in the Arizona desert. Really? And they've got a display of them. And they're only about, they're only about um, no bigger than three foot high. Wow, there we go. That'd be amazing to see. Wow. You know, a lot of people don't even realize that there's, you know, more than two breeds, of, well, now three breeds of camels, you know. So this is just so fascinating. Can I correct you? Not breeds. Species, species, yes. yes. Yeah, yes. I come from the yeah. horse world, so... <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I do too, actually. So it takes a little while to get used to it. I, 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 you know, I, I've learned to use the lingo correctly. Actually. Yeah, you do, don't you? That's for sure. That's good. That's for sure. That's good. So I want to ask, before we jump into more about how the Wild Camel Protection Foundation, like how it established and all that sort of stuff, uh, I think our listeners would love to hear how... Your story, I want you to tell it, of swimming 22 camels across a river. <laughs> well, I've done <laughs> other things beside, instead of Central Asia. Before I answer the question, just let your listeners know, I took camels from northern Nigeria, Lake Chad, um, to Tripoli, you know, in the capital of Libya, yeah. in 2002, 2003, which was a three-and-a-half-month journey and about 1,500 miles with dromedary camels. Yeah. And I did that partly because I wanted to and partly to raise awareness for the wild camel. Right. And it was sponsored by National Geographic, the American magazine that oh, everybody great. knows. Yeah. But then I did another expedition in Kenya. To the north of Kenya, there's a big lake called Lake Takana. Yeah. And um, I'm sure some of your listeners who've been to Kenya will know all about the lakes there. And, uh, Lake Takana is quite remote, right up in the north. And as far as we, we knew, nobody had ever taken camels all the way around the lake, which is a 450-mile journey. And um, so I, I had a great friend in Kenya, who a great camel man, Jasper Evans, and he kept 250 camels. And um, I did when I was working for the UN and hating the bureaucracy and being behind a desk because that's not my style. No, I can't um, imagine. I managed to go managed to go walk about with his camels. I used to just borrow two of his camels, an African an African boy, and we'd go and wander for for a week or two when I got a bit of leave from the from the UN. But this was a bigger one, and and uh, Jasper's grandson, a great guy called Josh. We went round uh, 
Lake Turkana with camels. Now, the difficulty of taking camels around Lake Turkana is that from Ethiopia, right in, in the north, there is a huge river that feeds the lake called the River Omo. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea how to get the camels across that river, even when we started. Um, we had all sorts of uh, funny things about strapping them to 44-gallon drum engines. <laughs> but but um, when we got there, we found that um, <coughs> we found an extraordinary man, actually, who, who, who quite a wild guy who lived up there, and he had a little outboard motor, uh, but you know, for a boat. And we managed to put that onto a native canoe. Um, which was just a hollowed out log and then we tied the camel one by one to the side of the canoe and with the little pup pup motor we went across the river now the river was as wide as two football pitches Whoa. and it was full of crocodiles oh uh -huh. my god and, <laughs> and so we had about we loaded up the bottom of the canoe with rocks and um, then took them across if we saw across, we had three or four African boys in the in the uh, in the canoe, and they chucked rocks at the crocodile. <laughs> we saw it. When we were going across the river. Now we had 22 camels. That that took a hell of a long time. Yes. You can appreciate. But a funny thing about camels: the first two or three uh, it was very difficult to strap them to the side of the canoe. <laughs> but camels are, are herd animals. Yes. So yeah. They're over on the other side. The ones that were left behind could see yes. that their mates had got wonderful grazing on the other side. Yes. And so uh, the ones at the end, the last three or four, they were pushing to get strapped to the canoe. <laughs> yeah. And they were right to, that so sounds about right. Separated. <laughs> yeah, that sounds exactly That's brilliantly right. done. We started about eight o'clock in the morning. We finished about eight o'clock at night. It was a very long day. Incredible. That is brilliant. That that's just the best story. That is brilliant. That's the most unique camel story. I, I don't think I've ever heard anything quite like that. But no. I mean, I've heard a lot of things from a lot of camel people. But by gee, that one takes the takes the cake. <laughs> 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 well done. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So that, wasn't that, long, that was too, That wasn't that long ago. I was in my seventies. That was two thousand and seven. <laughs> Yeah. <coughs> That's amazing. <laughs> no, well done. Okay, so, um, all right, so, gee whiz, you've done so much. I just want to get to where we're really up to now uh, with what you're doing. It's uh, obviously the Wild Camel Protection Foundation established the Hunter Hall Captive Wild Camel Breeding Centre. And you only had 12 yeah, camels. Right. Yeah, well, just to uh, backtrack a bit, um, after the expeditions in China, in Loch Noor, right. um, I saw we need to set up, a, a, and I got the money from the World Bank, as you remember, mm -hmm. we need to have a proper charity established. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, another amazing coincidence, but I came across a wonderful Australian lady called Catherine Ray, yeah. who is an environmental lawyer. And um, I put an advertisement in a, the Spectator magazine in England, which said, Explorer seeks... But what I was suddenly conscious of, the whole thing had got too big for me to handle. The right. whole thing had ballooned into, you know, starting a nature reserve, for goodness sake, <laughs> one of the biggest in the world. I needed help. Yeah. yeah. I needed money. And so I put an advertisement saying, Explorer seeks fundraiser on commission basis for unusual projects in Central Asia. Right. Well, that was the advertisement. Of course, a lot of people thought I was a spy or something, and <laughs> uh, I had a lot of funny replies. But there was one reply came from uh, a, a woman, and I learned later, her husband said, you're a bit bored with your job. Why don't you answer this advert? And she said, I can't answer that. I mean, you know, just don't know what he's like. And she said, there's a club in London. You go to that club in London, which is women only, and uh, meet him in the entrance. And if you don't like the look of him, just go into the club. And he can't come in. You can't, you can't get access. Uh, yeah. And so I met Catherine there, and immediately, I, previously I'd met another woman who actually scared the pants off me because she said she wanted control of everything and so I, I said no 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 that's not that's not you can't do that so then I met Catherine Ray this Aussie 
and we got on immediately. And Catherine and I set up the Wild Camel Protection Foundation. And Catherine at the moment is, is in Australia, actually. Uh, she's a Queens, Queenslander. Yeah. And um, she's in, she's in Mullaney. Uh, uh, if she oh, yeah. Hears yeah. This or, um, she's, yeah. Mullaney, is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and she's uh, coming back to England in August. Uh, and she has been, you know, they always say, behind a man there's a woman, or well, that's the old-fashioned expression. Mm. But she's been that to me. She, she's an environmental lawyer, so all the legal work and all the accounts, and much, much more than that, uh, Kate has um, helped me with. That is and very so we valuable. Are the co- we call it, we're the co-founders of the Wild Camel Protection Foundation. Yes. Now, today... That reserve in China, which we set up, that's been handed over to the Chinese. Okay. Uh, we had to do that. Yes. Yeah. And the son of the professor is the director, which is a lovely touch, because I know the son very well. He's been on all the expeditions with me, mm-hmm. and we're, in good, we're good friends and in good contact. Right. So that is running Beijing now knows about it, obviously, and they're funding it. <laughs> well, I believe they know about it, eh? <laughs> well, because I wrote, but, well, of course they did. You had to, they're, yes. They're, yeah. Chinese are clever, aren't they? Yeah. And um, in, uh, in Mongolia, as you just said, we set up the breeding centre. <clears throat> we call it the Hunter Hall Breeding Centre. Another Australian, um, Peter Hall, who... Um, was a insurance made, a businessman made a lot of money uh, for the company called Hunter Hall. Yeah. Uh, Peter actually he learned about us uh, after I was giving a talk actually, and he came forward and he gave the money to set up the breeding centre. So you've got a lot of Australian wow. input here. Yeah. You've got the, my co-founder who's an Aussie. And you've got the man who gave the money for the breeding centre, who's an Aussie. So that's, we have a lot of, you know, a good tie over this camel project. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and um, Peter is a great, a great, um, um, his great interest is trying to save endangered species, not just camels. Mm-hmm. And the Sumatran rhino is the big one for him at the moment. Where were we? Breeding centre, yeah. yeah. So we started... In 2004, with eight camels, and then, of course, in 2008, this was a new species of camel, and this was published. So our breeding centre became very important. Right. Um, it, it really, and so we got involved with scientists. We got a stud book. We genetically tested and retested all our camels wow. to make sure there's no hybridisation. They're genetically pure. Yes. And now we have 33 camels. Oh. We've made two into the wild and the big thing is now um, the expeditions the pioneering all the excitement of that that's a phase that has passed now we're into the phase where the scientists have to be involved and to make sure this species will be preserved Mm. uh, uh, even something drastic happens in China or Mongolia Mm. that we will have the nucleus of, of this species so we've signed an agreement with Prague Zoo Prague in, in Czech Republic because they have a long, long history of saving endangered species and we have a very good relationship with them. Yep. And in England there's a place called Nosley Park and they now provide all the vets to look after our camels at the breeding centre and as I say there's now 33 and so that is the only place in the world where genetically pure wild camels are kept in captivity. Whoa. That okay. is incredible. Okay. When you put it like that, yeah. I think that's absolutely... Put a bit of a chill up my spine, yeah, me actually, too. John. <laughs> that, I mean, this work is so important. Okay, just to um, clarify, there, so with that breeding um, program, you've managed to, from the initial camels that you start with, there's been 33 wild camels from that. Yeah, the big problem with any breeding centre, as anybody will tell you, is that you tend to get more males than females. Yes. Right. And what do, you, what do you do with the males? Now, the Mongolian government won't let us export them. They won't let us castrate them. Right. Uh, so we only have one option, which is to release them. Right. And obviously that's not ideal. Yes. And then, you know, but we collar them with satellite collars. Yes. And we release them two lots, into one of eight and one of 
and one of um, two. First one was two. Sorry, the first one was two. The next lot were five. And um, of the two that we released first, there's a marvelous picture on our website. Um, because we, you know, people said, you know, these will just die. these camels just die. Put them in the wild; they won't be able to survive. Yeah. But we've got a photo trap in in the Mongolian area where the camels are. Yeah. A photo camera, I should say, and um, it caught a picture of one of the camels we released with four wild females. Right. In other words, it has it has gathered the nucleus of a herd around it. Okay. So that was incredibly encouraging for us. Yes. Uh, to see that it does actually work, that they can attract females from the wild and start their own herd. Wow. Yeah. So um, have you seen any evidence of calves being born in the wild? No, no. We haven't. Not Nothing that we could prove that were from um, released yeah. uh, males. No, no. Just that one photograph pro- proves that he had collected females. Yeah. That's that's fantastic, uh, yeah. Mm. So on a long-term basis here, tell our audience how important this breeding centre is and, and the future plans for it. Well, one thing I haven't mentioned is that we have a, a, a Scottish girl called Anna Jemmett, and she is doing a PhD on the wild camel. Wow. And we are paying for her to do this. Wow. Now this, you know, um, there, will, there will come a stage when I will have to um, take a step backwards. Yes. As I told you, I don't talk about retiring, but, you know, I'll, Anna Dom and I will catch up in the end. Yes. And so we've got a, a girl who's actually, she will become, I hope, the, the world expert on the wild camel because she's doing a scientific a uh, PhD, a uh, doctorate on it, and uh, she goes out to Mongolia very regularly, and she's very much concerned with the breeding center. Mm-hmm. She's been responsible for getting the stud book together mm-hmm. and uh, many other aspects of this. We also have the leading Mongolian wild camel scientist, uh, a man called Adia, and Adia is working with us, and uh, he's an excellent man. Uh, terrific knowledge. He's not just somebody with who sits behind a desk. This is a real uh, guy for the bush, uh, but also with a lot of camel knowledge. And um, he, he is working for us. So we've got those two people of a younger generation hoping to carry, carry this project forward. And awesome. in China, of course, we've got the professor's son who's director of... And so all these people are sort of middle 30s to early 40s that's so right. um, that's the next generation to take it forward that's right. that's Terrific. really great to hear really um, because this is such an important project i believe oh, and yeah. i think a lot of people think that as well yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, patron, i haven't mentioned i'm sorry to interrupt you Listen. Tara, but i haven't mentioned that our life patron and some of your listeners will know her is Jane Goodall, yes. Yes. and uh, Jane Goodall is the chimpanzee's lady, and she's, mm-hmm. she's a wonderful woman, um, and uh, she's our life patron and is a great support for me, a uh, great help to me. That's fantastic. Um, she, she, she has worked for years fundraising and for her own projects, but she's helped me a lot. Right. Um, I'm very conscious that we must have younger people taking the whole project forward because absolutely i know other organizations which have been built around the name of one person yes and when that one person dies then the whole thing collapses yes so and and kate in particular is very keen on this that we have a young team and that's what we're doing that's that's um i feel happy now that if i um, croak tomorrow <laughs> and there would be uh, there would be young younger generation to take it forward yeah and yeah. and that is the perfect legacy you want to leave and the perfect thing that you want to carry on into the future and it's funny because just the other day um, I, like our kids we've got three children and they they've had a lot of camel experience since birth really and you know we trek and we we've done the commercial stuff and we do crazy adventures with them and we have them here at home um, and and 
I, I knew that this conversation was coming up with you and our daughter, she's 10. I thought, I don't think we've ever told her about the wild camels in Mongolia. Mm. So I told her about it and she, like, she expressed a lot of interest. She's like, oh, so they're different from the Bactrian camel. I said, yeah, they're the wild Mongol, you know, wild Mongolian camel. And um, she's like, wild, oh. Uh, what, the wild, wild camel. The, the wild, wild camel, camel, yes. In China. Yeah, so I, China too, so wild camel, yeah. yeah, I I say the That's Mongolian cool. part cuz like a lot of people in Australia still think well Australia camels are wild, so <laughs> Um, so yeah. I'll just clarify that. Um, so, yeah, and, and immediately she f- she started to create an interest in it because she writes these little essays for school and she has to present it to her class. And she's been doing it all sorts of animals. She's a keen animal lover. And all of a sudden she says, I want to raise, I think she said, $2 million, $2 million. <laughs> <laughs> for the wild camels. <laughs> and I said, well, that's that's okay, but let's just start with $1,000 maybe. <laughs> we won't be able to get it realistic then. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is it's really important that mm. I think as parents or grandparents or what have you um, and our listeners here is to educate your, the children around us on these really important matters about um, animals that are endangered and for us being, you know, yeah. quite severe camel lovers, mm. um, you know, we, I, we're going to educate our children that this is not our, right. our world in Australia is not not just the only world that we have with camels. There's yeah. other camels there's, out there, and so many different cultures as well attached to the camels. And in this case exactly. here, mm. you've got wild I mean, camels. When I, mean, I cro- when I crossed the Sahara, I took Tuareg people. Yep. Uh, for your listeners, the Tuareg are the people who live in the Sahara, mm-hmm. on, and their life is uh, based on the camel culture. Now, in in their um, thinking, I remember the man saying to me, in the world, first of all, there's Tuaregs, mm-hmm. there's us, then there's camels, then there's the rest of the world. Yeah. And in other words, in the hierarchy of their thinking, after, after their own race, yeah. camels were more important than all the other races in the world. Oh, yeah. absolutely. We interviewed a beautiful man, C.D. Amar. He, he's a, a Tuareg, and he um, he's working in the United States. He sort of goes back and forth to his home. Um, and, yeah, he had amazing stories about his life growing up with camels and how extremely connected they are to to the camels. We in, interviewed him on this podcast, so any of our listeners, you can go back and listen yeah, to that. that is your head. Um, mm. This is amazing. Let's get to the point of how the foundation because the foundation obviously rely on a lot of community support from people so how what is what are the current projects or the ones in the future and how do you how what support do you guys need in the foundation at this point in time right Right. there's two immediate answers to that question um first of all at the at the we have to feed the captive wild camels um during the winter months Mm -hmm. right Obviously, they're in, the, they're in an enclosure, uh, which is about 70 hectares, about 150 acres. Mm-hmm. And um, you can't keep them there all the year, otherwise it would be fouled up and everything would be grazed to nothing. Mm-hmm. Yes. So during the summer months, uh, we supervise them and we, we, uh, they graze outside because they're only active and... and, and um, Dangerous during the mating pe- period during the coldest months of the year yep. when they're in the enclosure. Now, we have to feed them in the winter. That costs 10,000 US dollars. That sounds an awful lot of money. Not to people like us who have to feed our camels. <laughs> hay, hay doesn't grow in the Gobi. No. And half of that money is, is transport costs. Yes. Yeah. From Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, it's 1,500 kilometers, mm-hmm. yeah, no, 1,200 kilometers, about 800 miles. And that hay has to be brought from the northern area. And for half of that uh, mileage uh, is unpaved road, unmade road, and it's, it's, a, it's a rough old track. Mm-hmm. So half the cost of that 10,000 is in transport. Mm-hmm. Right. But the big thing we need at the moment, um, we have in the past done what's called a hard release. In other words, we've released these two releases we've done. We've just released the camels into the desert. And Prague Zoo and other scientists have said, look, we must have what's called a soft release 
In other words, if they, you release them by stages, you acclimatize them to the fact that they're going into the wild and gradually, under supervision, they get released. Okay. But to do that, you need a separate enclosure some way, a good way away from our breeding centre. Yes. Right. And we've just, we've just identified the site and we need money for fencing, for mm. uh, a little building and everything. So we're fundraising for that for the second soft release enclosure. Mm. Right. Um, that is, is, is something that I'm actively fundraising for at the front moment. And the third thing we're fundraising for is an educational program, which you've mentioned. Not only the local people, which is very important that the local people understand what we're doing, yes. why we're trying to save the wild camel, and educate the children in schools. We've started little science clubs and things mm -hmm. to get the kids interested in this amazing wildlife in, in the Gobi. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the third project. Uh, so in other words, there's... The continual project for the hay we're fundraising, the second amount is for another release centre, and the third is for education. Right. Yeah, okay. They are all very important. Totally. Um, and, I mean, there's so many ideas that, I mean, if people out there, obviously you can make your donations through the website. It's Wild Camel, sorry, www.wildcamels with an S on the end wildcamels.com obviously three big things feeding camels um, the education side of things and fencing fencing for this new enclosement new, 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 new soft release enclosure yeah I love that idea of a soft release because you can kind of monitor them and just exactly yeah, yeah I, I love exactly. that idea that's really good yeah. now I have a question for you before we wrap up here are you planning more any any more camel adventures? Um, I think um, the days of the expeditions um, are just about over. Okay. But there's a, uh, there's a nice man, and I was trying to think of his name just now, if he's listening, and he runs expeditions in the, in the Simpson Desert. Ah, uh, Andrew Harper. Uh, but that, this isn't tourists. This is for scientists and people. Yes, that's and right, yes. When he came to London. Sorry? Andrew Harper is his name? Andrew, that's yeah. right. And hello, Andrew, if you're listening, because uh, I met Andrew and his wife when I was in Australia, and then I came to his talk in London. And he said, John, if ever you want to come with us and our camels into the Simpson Desert, well, uh, if you're up for it, um, we'd love to have you. And so um, I'm still up for it, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. I, I, I think you would love that. <laughs> yeah, he sure would. <laughs> That's yeah, great. Harper, that's right. And um, anything else? Well, not major. I, I mean, it was quite a major expedition for me to go out in January in minus 32, I can tell you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's um, insane. Because, <laughs> but people live out uh, in I that. Got, like, it's I incredible. I major camel expedition planned. Yeah. Because that phase, as I tried to explain to you, has really passed now. Yes. yes. We've set up the reserve. We've... we've now got the breeding centre, um, and also in China, for political reasons, which I won't go into, the surrounding area is very difficult at the moment. Yes. Um, I don't yeah. want to get into politics, but yeah. Uh, yeah. that makes it difficult in China. So now, can you please tell our listeners, there are a couple of books that you've written about these camel adventures. Can you just name the title of those so people can go and have a look and, and read them? Absolutely. The Lost Camels of Tartary. Mm -hmm. The Lost Camels of Tartary. Tartary, T-A-R-T-A-R-A-Y, Tartary. Is that right? Tartary. T-A-R-Y, sorry, Tartary. Um, you can either get them from my website, which is johnhare.org.uk, mm -hmm. or I suppose you can, you can get them on Amazon. Uh, but you get a much better deal from me. I found them um, on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> and also another one called The Mysteries of the Gobi, which is um, published by IB Taurus, but you can get that from me too mm -hmm. on my website, um, johnhair.org.uk. And um, I have written other books, obviously, as I told you. Yes. Uh, if anybody's interested in the African side, my African story... I was just lecturing yesterday about it, actually, because this is, this is out of context now. But I worked in the area 
uh, not this area on the plateau I told you about, but I worked for two years in the area where Boko Haram, and I'm sure your listeners, most of your listeners will know what that is, that um, terrorist organization in, yes. in Africa, where they're active now. And so I give a talk on the historical background to Boko Haram, and I've written a book about that and my time in northern Nigeria called Last Man In. And uh, that wow. is again available from my website. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can't. I can't wait to read your book. So like I, I've just, like I said, I had. I got mine through eBay. So I can't wait to yeah. get get into it. And um, you've got yeah, some incredible thanks, stories. Thanks, mm. Can I just give a send a message to Kalamunda Camel people at Perth? Uh, <laughs> just give them greetings because. Uh, um, I enjoyed my time very much with you there. They are actually milking camels there. I did, did you know that? Yes, 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 we did, yeah. yeah. They took me out in the bush. We went for a trek with camels um, in the Kalamunda Forest, I think it is. And that, that was very interesting for me. So, um, fantastic. To them. Um, John, thank you so much for your time. I, I don't know about everybody else, but oh. <laughs> this has been so good. Gob, gobsmacked. <laughs> and, like, um, <laughs> and thank you for doing this great work that you're doing with the Wild Camel. It's, um, it's much needed, and it's a weird sort of set of circumstances that led you into this, this lifelong project, and it's a legacy you're going to leave. Yeah. I, I think it's a brilliant legacy that you're leaving, John, and, um, you know, total kudos to you. Um, and certainly to your team that you've developed already for this project and you know we hope that uh, many of our listeners take this into their heart and give it all the support they possibly can Hmm. I I would just emphasize for your younger listeners once again that story that Imagine, I didn't start this till I was in my early 50s. Mm -hmm. And it was by that chance conversation with a Russian. So uh, my message to you would never give up. There's something might come your way which will change your life. And it changed my life in my 50s. Um, I had background in the bush and everything, but this totally changed my life. And uh, so it's never too late. And you never retire. No, never <laughs> retire. I like that. That's the best <laughs> advice. <laughs> thank you ever so okay, much, John. Lovely to talk to you, and thank you very much for all the work you do to publicise the camel. Thank you. It's, thank uh, you. it's okay. absolutely our pleasure. Hey there. We're looking for eight adventurous people to join us as a team in the Mongolian Altai Mountains, home of the famous eagle hunters. In September of 2019, we'll be buying, training and gifting eight Batram camels to a local nomadic family and we're inviting you to be part of this unique experience. When we travel international, we like to get a taste of what it's really like to live like the locals. For our trip to Mongolia this year, this means living with a nomadic family far away from cities, sleeping in traditional Mongolian gurs learning local customs, bonding and sharing our cultures. Our 2019 Mongolian Camel Journey is for the open-hearted and minded individuals who are willing to be flexible and to expect the unexpected. We'll be spending five days training at eight Bactrim Camels using our Camel Connection Trust-Based Camel Training in preparation for our camel trek to a local camel and eagle festival and of course their new home with a nomadic family. We're looking for adventurous camel lovers, people willing to work in a team and be flexible and of course willing to have the time of their lives. Trips like this will open your heart and mind and leave lasting impressions which you just cannot find anywhere else. To find out more about our 2019 Mongolian Camel Journey and to apply before applications close, visit camelconnection.com forward slash Mongolia.